Hello and welcome to HolyImpactMinistries.com Bible Study Night. I'm Pastor Scott Villain with HolyImpactMinistries.com. God bless you and thank you for sharing your time with us here today. We are now looking at the ninth chapter of the book of Romans. And we have been uh, through uh, eight uh, subsequent uh, chapters, previous chapters, and we uh, are now moving into the ninth chapter. So, uh, if you have not seen the first eight chapters or studied those with us, please take the time to take a look at those. We have covered a lot of ground, and there's a lot of information that you need to understand in order to better grasp what is going on in the ninth chapter of the book of Romans. With that being said, we are going to now proceed into the ninth chapter of the book of Romans. Let's go over and take a look at that. You can read that along with me. Romans 9.1. Paul says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promise. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race according to the flesh is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Now I want to stop right there for just a moment we can see that we have to remember Paul is a Benjamite. He is also a Pharisee. So Paul really identifies with the Israelite people. He is well versed in these things. And uh, he knows that the Israelite people have had a very difficult time. And uh, so he is saying here, and he's giving credit to the Israelite people so that everyone may know and understand that they are God's chosen people. He says, to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promise. He says, even from their race, our Messiah came out of uh, the Israelites. You have to remember, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, was called Rabbi Yeshua. He was a rabbi. He came out of the house of David, the tribe of Judah. It is the blood of a Jew that covers the transgressions of the whole world. And we need to know and understand that. Many Christians have a very difficult time uh, with that understanding. But it is written, and it's right here in front of our faces. And we can know and we can understand that Yeshua HaMashiach himself was indeed a Jew. So uh, for those of you who are uh, full of anti-Semitism and all of these types of things, you need to stop and think who it is you're talking about. And we need to go back and look at history to know and to understand what the position of the Jewish people and the rest of the Israelites really, really is. We have to remember that our Messiah said that he came for the lost sheep of Israel. Now, who's the lost sheep of Israel? Well, again, we have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah with some Benjamites in it. And the northern kingdom was divorced from God and dispersed into the, all four corners of the earth for their adultery and their whoredom with other idols and all, all kinds of other gods. So God uses the analogy. He says, I have, I have divorced you. That's it. I'm finished. You just, just get out of here. And he says, you are no longer my people. Okay? But he promised them in the book of Hosea that he, in the second chapter, in fact, of the book of Hosea, that he would bring them back. And we may take a look uh, a little bit at that uh, here today. But uh, I want to go ahead and move on here uh, from this point. Again, Paul, a Benjamite, talking about uh, the Israelites and helping people to know and understand who the Israelites really are and that Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, came from the Israelites. Okay? So let's continue on. He says, but it is not through the word, of, not though, that he says that it is not though the word of God has failed. Okay, but the Israelites failed. The word of God did not fail. Okay, that's what he's saying. He says, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are, are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But, he says, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Now, remember, Abraham had eight children. Okay? He had Ishmael through Hagar. 
He had Isaac through Sarah, and then after Sarah passed away, he married Kator, and she had six children, six males, okay, six sons. So we had eight eight children altogether. And what Paul is saying is, here is, not all children of Abraham, not all are children of Abraham, just because they're his offspring. He says, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He says, this means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring, the children of the promise coming through Isaac. Okay? All right, let's continue on. He says, for this is what the promise said. He said, about this time next year, I will return and Sarah will have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather, Isaac. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might come, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now, if you remember this uh, from the, uh, the Torah, uh, Jacob was the loved one, and Esau was the hated one. And again, we can look back at history and no one understand that the descendants of Esau uh, are the Roman Catholic Church. But that is another study. We won't get into that right now. We will cover that at a later time and date. So he goes on and he says this. He says, so what should we say then? Is there injustice on God's part, he says? By no means, because one was elected and one was not. He says, for he says to Moses, he says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. This is God speaking. He says, so then it depends not on human will or exhortation, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, now he's talking about the Pharaoh of Egypt that uh, was... Uh, uh, the Pharaoh over the Israelites and had put them into bondage. For the scripture it says to Pharaoh, he says, for this very purpose I raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So when he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills, okay, he, God has mercy on whoever he wants to have mercy on, and he hardens the heart of whoever he wills. He says, you might say to me then, he says, why does he still find fault? He says, for who can resist his will? Okay, so they're asking, well, if that's the case, then, you know, how can God find fault with Pharaoh then? If he's used him to harden his heart to show his, his power. He says, this is what Paul says. He says, but who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to the molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the parter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Okay? So basically what Paul is saying here is, listen guys, God is God, and we are not. It's just that simple. God chooses whom he will choose. You know, there's a lot of us that uh, believe that there are evil people that we know that are just not ever going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. You know, I cannot walk into a, a tavern and find a drunk guy slouched over the bar and look at him and say, you're going to hell because of what you're doing. I can't do that because I don't know what's in that man's heart. God will choose who it is he has mercy on, and who it is he does not. And there are many people who have done many horrible, horrible things that will make it into the kingdom of heaven. And there are many people who we think are godly and even pastors who are not going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. And that's what Paul is trying to get through to us here. He's trying to 
kind of shake us and wake us up here a little bit so that uh, we can know and we can understand. Listen, God is God and God chooses. Okay, let's continue on here now. It says, as indeed, he says in Hosea, he says, those who are not my people, I will call my people and her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in that very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. Now I want to stop right there. Once again, my friends, so far all the way down to this point in uh, this 26th verse of the ninth chapter, this is all about the Israelites people. Many people will take this verse out of context and they will say, well, he's talking about the Gentiles here. You know, those who are not my people, I will call my people, and her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. He's talking about Gentiles. No. Very clearly, he says, as indeed he says in Hosea. Now, he's talking about the second chapter of Hosea. Those who are not my people, I will call my people, and her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. He's talking about that northern kingdom of Israel where he divorced them and said, you are not my people. Okay, let's take a look at, um, I want to take a look at Hosea. Let's take a look at Hosea here. What does he say down here? Hosea 20, or 2.23, I'm just going to read this. And I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. Now, who's he talking about here? He's talking about the Israelites. Let's read this section in the blue. He says, And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And in that day I will answer, declares the Lord, I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth, and the earth shall answer the grain and the wine and the oil, and they shall answer Jezreel. And I will sow her for myself in the land. And I will have, once again, I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say, not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. Now, if we read this whole section here from Hosea 2, 1 on down, you will see he, God's wrath for the people of Israel. He is extremely full of wrath over them. But he promises them at the very end of this chapter that he will bring them back. And this is what he's talking about uh, in uh, this ninth chapter. Okay, He's talking about, he says, as indeed, as he says in Hosea, he's pointing to the book of Hosea. Uh, again, those people who are not my people because I divorced them, I will once again call my people, and her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. He's talking about the northern kingdom. He says, in that very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, okay, he's talking about Jerusalem, there they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Once again, he's talking about Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. So there will be a remnant of them that will be saved. And I just want us to know, and I want us to kind of understand this um, so that we can know and understand. Let's let's take a look very quickly at what our Messiah said, who, he, who it was that he came for. Uh, we're going to turn to Matthew 15.22. And let's just read this. He says, And behold, a Canaanite woman from, the, from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay? So, there it is. That's what our Messiah came for. He came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He had to bring them back. That was his job. Before the Gentiles could all be grafted back in again, he had to reinstate 
the Israelites, who were God's only begotten, only chosen people, they were the bride. They are the bride. And uh, if we are uh, part of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, then we know that we are the offspring of Abraham. If Christ is in us, then we are the offspring of Abraham, and therefore heirs of the promise, just like he tells us in the book of Galatians. Now, uh, and once again, let's take a look at that. Uh, I want to just take a look at that so there's no question. It says, For as many of you, this is Galatians 3.27, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And if, hear this now, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Okay? So I want to keep this all nice and neat uh, so that we can know and understand exactly what Paul's talking about here. So many people will tear this apart and they will say that Romans 9.25 is all about the Gentiles and it's all about, you know, the, the Gentiles are replacing the Israelites and all this nonsense. And he says clearly, he says, he's quoting from the book of Isaiah, or Hosea. He's talking about Isaiah. He's talking about uh, the, uh, uh, the Torah is what he's talking about. And he's been talking about that all the way down so far. Okay? So let's go ahead and let's continue on now. So the, all of that is about the, uh, the Israelites. He says, And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left his offspring, we would be like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Okay? But he did not do that. And he sent them out into the four corners of the earth. And Yeshua came to save the lost sheep of Israel, which were the, uh, those who were spread out and divorced from God, who were in the process of being disseminated into the four corners of the world. He says this. Now, this is where he starts talking about Gentiles. So that's right here in the red part down at the bottom, starting with Romans 9.30. Now the, the idea of the Gentile comes in. He says, so what shall we say then? He says that Gentiles who did not pursue, right, pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Okay, now I want us to hear this so far. This is astounding information, and it's important that we get this right. He says, so what shall we say then? He says, the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, okay, they didn't pursue, what is righteousness? That's obedience to the law. That's what righteousness is. Obedience to the things of God. In order to be righteous, you must be obedient to the things of God. He says, the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness or pursue the law have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. Okay, now what did Paul say at the very first chapter of the book of Romans? What does Paul talk about? The obedience of faith. And we're going to get into that right here. He says, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness. Now, does he say Israel pursued a law that was bondage and a curse? No. He says, Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why not? He asks, why? What does he say? Because the Israelites did not pursue the law by faith, but as if it were based on works. Are we hearing what Paul is saying here? Paul is saying because they, the Israelites, did not pursue the law by faith. They pursued it as if it were based on works. Okay? What, does, what has God always wanted from the Israelite people? For them to follow his laws, not based on works, but from the heart. He wanted his laws in their heart. He wanted them to obey him because they loved him, and they understood that he indeed is the God of the universe. He is the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the one who created the heavens and the earth and created us. He is the one whose image we are made in and, and created in. And that's what he wanted. He always wanted his laws written in the hearts of men. But you see, the Israelites wouldn't have anything to do with that. You know, they were keeping the law uh, by works. And they felt that if they just kept the law, then they would just deserve to get into heaven. 
Not only were they not keeping God's laws, but they wrote their own laws over top of God's laws, which completely takes the authority away from Yahweh God the Father and puts it in the hands of men. And that's exactly what uh, Roman, the Roman Catholic Church has done early in the 2nd uh, and 3rd century, beginning with Constantine. They have overwritten the laws, the commandments, the feast days, the Sabbaths. They've overwritten everything that has to do with Yahweh God the Father. Why? Because once they start making the laws, then it is by their authority. Do you understand what the, why they do these things? They do these things to take the authority away from God and to give that authority to themselves. Who is it that forgives sins? Is it the Catholic Church? Or is it Yahweh God the Father? You know, there was an article just today that the uh, the, the Pope, uh, George Bergoglio, has uh, designated 1,000 priests to go out now and to forgive sins. And we have that uh, posted at uh, thevalainreport.com. You can go read that article. We have a quick link to it there. Uh, even today, they still are telling people that it is the church that forgives sins. The church has no business saying such a thing, no business selling indulgences, no business forgiving sin. What does our Messiah say? He says, call no man rabbi, for you are all brothers, and you have one teacher. Call no man your father on this earth, for you have one father in heaven. And call no man your instructor, for you have one instructor the Christ. So we can know and we can understand this is why men do these things. And the Pharisees and the scribes did it in Yeshua's time, and Catholicism and the Protestant churches are doing it in our time. It's the same thing. They are stealing from God. They are stealing his authority, stealing his laws, his commandments, his appointments, and his feast days and his Sabbaths, and turning them into this menage a trois of garbage and filth and demonic demon or uh, doctrines of demons. And that's all it is, my friends. And we need to know and we need to understand why it is that men do these things. So, not only did they just not obey God's laws, they wrote their own laws on top of them. And we're going to and Paul talks a little bit about this as we move on. But I want us to hear this in Romans 9:32. He says because they did not pursue the law by faith but as if it were based on works. What are we going through today? What are we going through today? Almost the same exact thing. People are always saying that the law is all about works. If you're obeying the law, then you're doing works. But what does the Bible say the very definition of the love of God is? For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Now, if his commandments are not burdensome, then are they work? How can something that's not burdensome be work? It's not work. It's what we want to do. It's what we choose to do. Okay, it's by because we're we're doing it by faith. We don't obey the laws of God to be saved. We obey the laws of God because we are saved. And there is no such thing uh, as this once saved, always saved, do as thou wilt religion that is out there today. Uh, and this really puts a cap on it. And this tells us that there's really not that much difference between the Torah, the Old Testament, and the New Testament. God has always wanted his laws written in the hearts of men. That's where he wanted them. David was a man of God's own heart, was he not? It says so very clearly in the Bible that he was of God's own heart. Now, did David sin? Yes, he sinned all over the place. He committed adultery. He killed the man's, or the woman's husband, even. He, was, he did horrible debauchery and horrible things, David did. But he knew how to repent. And he knew when he'd done wrong, many times without realizing it, because the world has just swept him away. You know, a lot of things happen when you're a king. But he knew how to repent. He knew how to get on his knees. He knew how to dress in sackcloth and throw ashes on his head. He knew how to fast and not eat until he was forgiven. He knew, he knew how to, to repent and turn away from his sin. And God knew in his heart that he had repented and he was sorry for what he did. And that's what it's all about, my, my friends. 
If you think God's laws are evil, read the uh, Psalms 119 that was written by David. He talks nothing about anything except for the love of God's law. It's all about the love of God's law, God's perfect law, not God's bondage-filled, curse-filled, sinful law, God's perfect and holy law. You see, David had the laws of God written in his heart, and God knew it, and he was way ahead of his time because he truly loved God's law because he understood that the laws of God were God. They are, in essence, God. They keep us from sin. They keep us following him and not following his adversary. If we're keeping the God's laws, we are not going to be uh, caught up in sin, and we're not going to be caught up in following the God of this world. We're going to be caught up in following him. What did Yeshua say? Pick up your cross and follow me. Be perfect even as I am perfect. But what do you hear Christians all day today say? Every day, all day, I hear them all, well, you know, I, I'm not saved by work, so I, you know, I don't even, might as well not even try because I know I can't be perfect. And they throw their hands up and they walk away right back into their sin like a dog returning to its vomit. And the Bible warns us against these things time and time and time again. So here we can see it in Romans 9.32 that it was because the Israelites did not pursue his laws by faith, but as if they were based on works. That's why they fell. Now listen to this. It says, they have stumbled over the stumbling stone. What was the stumbling stone? It was Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, who came to do away with the penalty of the law. Now there's no penalty of the law, right? And you must believe in Yeshua HaMashiach because you need to know and see what he did. You've got to be able to see what he did. You've got to be able to recognize what sin is. You know, all of the hateful deeds that were in those men's hearts, who stripped him of his clothes, who punched him in the face, who tore his beard out of his face, who, who mocked him, who pushed the crown of thorns on his head, who, who took up lots for his clothes, who humiliated him, who beat him and flogged him and scourged him, this is the same sinful nature that we see in ISIS today. Exactly the same demonic behavior. It is what sin leads to, and it is what we will become if we continue to dabble in sin. And if we continue to just say, oh, this is okay, this is okay, this is okay, and let people tear down uh, what we believe and continuously give up what we know should not be given up. We need to follow the laws of God, follow his Sabbaths, do as he says, and we will not be caught up in that sin. Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, died to show us what sin is. This is what the whole world is going to become like if you, if you don't come back to Yahweh God the Father. You will become these men that hung me on the cross. You will become these heartless, ruthless people. You will die in your iniquity and in your sin. You must follow me. I am the life, the way I am, the only way. I am the only mediator between Yahweh God the Father is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. There is no other way. So this, again, is just what Yahweh God was trying to tell him. You know, if they would have followed my laws and pursued it with faith, they would have found the righteousness that they are seeking. But they did not. They treated it as it was works. It was some mechanical thing that they had to do. And then once they did it, their vanity all puffed up, their chest puffed out. They thought they just earned their way into heaven. Not only did they not do God's laws, but again, they wrote their own laws over top of it. And then here comes Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, to show them how to follow the law and how to pursue the law by faith. That's what he came to show us. He says, as it is written, behold, I am laying a Zion, uh, in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Okay, so again, here comes the Messiah and these Jewish people just have, because they are so caught up in themselves and their own vanity and obeying the law without faith, 
and just thinking that all they have to do is obey the law, they couldn't even see him, even though he was standing right before them. Their own God was standing there right in front of them, and they didn't even know it. So, once again, it was, has always, from the very beginning, been about pursuing God and pursuing the law by faith, with the obedience of faith, not to be saved, but because we are saved. Let's move into chapter 10. He says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for, for them is that they may be saved. Again, talking about the Israelites. He says, For I bear, uh, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not uh, according to knowledge. So they have this, this want, this need to follow uh, Yahweh God the Father. But they don't have the knowledge. They don't have the knowledge because they don't believe in the Messiah. And he's trying to get them to come together. He's trying to bring them into that pocket. He's trying to make them understand, look, he was here. You hung him on a cross. Okay, you got to take that responsibility. you got to know who he was and admit your sin. Repent and pick up your cross and follow him. So he says they have a zeal for God, but they don't have uh, the knowledge that they need. He says, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own righteousness, he says they did not submit to God's righteousness. And there it is, again, just what we were just talking about. He says, For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Now, what is what is God's righteousness? It is His laws, His commandments, His precepts, His appointments, right? That's what righteousness is. And we've been through this in the previous chapters, in our previous studies. What is the biblical definition of righteousness? obedience to the things of Yahweh God the Father. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. He who says he knows him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Okay, very good. Then he goes on to say this, For Christ is the end of the law. Do you, do you see that? Let me ask you, my friends, is that what you see in this verse in 10.4, Romans 10.4, for Christ is the end of the law, or do you see something else there? Because I cannot tell you how many times somebody has quoted this out of context to me. People that believe that the law is dead and the law is all nailed to the cross and they don't have to be bothered with doing anything and it all oh, doesn't matter what I do. I'm saved. I'm once saved, always saved. I've said my prayer confession. I've been baptized now. I can just do what I want to do because I'm sealed. My salvation is sealed, right? Because Christ is the end of the law. And that's what they'll tell you. But I want you to see this. There's more here, isn't there? It's blacked out. So you know there's more there. Let's take a peek behind the veil and see what it really says. Because it, I assure you, my friends, it does not say that Christ is the end of the law. Let's see what it says. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Now let's just stop right there. That just That's a preposition. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness is much different than Christ is the end of the law, isn't it? It is. So Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Why? Because he came to take away the penalty of the law. You cannot be righteous by keeping the law. You cannot. Because he's taken that away now. You cannot keep the law without faith. Again, Paul is talking about a law that you are keeping, you Pharisees are still keeping the law, thinking you're going to make it into the gates of heaven. He says, you're, you're trying to be righteous. He says, you're not going to be able to be righteous in the eyes of God by keeping that law without faith. What is the rest of this sentence? To everyone who believes. Okay? For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Okay, so for uh, the end of the Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to us, to we who believe. Okay, we who believe, we know we're not going to be righteous by keeping the law. That does not make us righteous. What makes us righteous is to, is to keep the greatest commandment. What is the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your strength, all your mind, and all, all your soul, everything, right? 
That's the greatest commandment. And the second's like it, to love your brother like yourself, right? So if you love God, if you have seen what his son went through to show us sin, to die for our sins, to be a propitiation for our sins, to be the Passover sacrificial lamb that was slain for our sins, then we already have the laws of God written in our hearts. They're not nailed to a cross somewhere. We see what he did. They are nailed or to our they are written in our hearts and in our minds. And that's why we follow them. We have the obedience of faith. And it is the Holy Spirit of God Yahweh who drives us to want to do the things of God. We, we, what is the love of God again? The love of God, the biblical definition, is that we keep his commandments and they are not burdensome. Once again, if something is not burdensome, it is not work, is it? Is it work for us to keep the seventh-day Sabbath? No, we look forward to the seventh-day Sabbath. It is our day to be with our Messiah and to be with our brothers and sisters. It is our day to keep holy, to remember him and to slow down and step out of the world and step into the the Holy of Holies. That is exactly what it is, and that's why we keep it. We look forward to the Seventh-day Sabbath. It's not a burdensome to us. It's not works. Okay, It's something we do because we love him. We look forward to it. We want to do it. And the same with the rest of the laws. We want to follow him. We do not want to follow the, the God of this world. If you are a friend of this world, you are an enemy of God. James 4.4. 4. Okay. So, uh, we need to know and understand these things. This is exactly what Paul is trying to tell us. He says, For being ignorant of the righteousness of God, and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Okay? Not the end of the law... Doesn't mean the end, the law is thrown away or the law is done out. What did he say? What did our own Messiah say in Matthew five seventeen? He says, "I did not come to abolish the law." And he says, "Until heaven and earth pass away, not the crossing of a T or the dotting of an I is going to pass away from the law." We're still standing on the earth. He did not come to abolish the law. It's really not that hard to understand. Well, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. You cannot be follow the law and be righteous to everyone who believes. We know that. We don't follow the law to be righteous. We follow the laws of God because we love God and because they are God's laws. They are part of him. And we are to be perfect even as he is perfect. To pick up our cross and to follow him. Yahweh, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, the Son of uh, God, came to do all of the laws. Did he not keep all of the laws? Yes, he did. Did he not keep all the feast days? Yes, he did. Did he not keep all the Sabbaths? Yes, he did. Follow me. He says, I came, it did not come to abolish the laws. I came to fulfill them. I came to do them. It's very simple. And heaven and earth, again, once again, will pass away uh, before all before any of God's laws pass away. Even the crossing of a T or the dotting of an I will not pass away until heaven and earth pass away. I mean, it's just very simple. We can read the text and know the truth. We don't have to listen to these lies that we are being perpetrated and fed to us. He says this. He says, for Moses writes about the righteous that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. He says, but the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven or who will descend into the abyss. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and where? In your heart. In your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe where? In your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Why? Because you will have the obedience of faith. And God's laws will not be burdensome to you. God's commandments will not be burdensome to you. And this is what faith is all about, and that's what righteousness is all about. It says, For with the heart one believes and is justified. With the mouth one confesses and is, is saved. Let's take a look at Jeremiah 31, 31. I have that bookmarked here, uh, E4. I want to take a look at that very quickly. What does it say? Jeremiah 31, 33. This is the new covenant that everyone's talking about. 
Okay, this is the this is the one everybody says. I'm a new covenant Gentile. I'm a new covenant Gentile. Oh, this is this is what it is. This is what it is. This is what it is, and we need to know that this is what it is. He says this. He says, "For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days." Now, notice he says that I will make with the house of Israel. You, as a Christian, are part of the house of Israel. If you do not know that, if you do not believe that, read Romans 11. It's the next chapter that we're going to go through next week. And it will take any question out of your mind. You need to know this. You need to understand. There are no other people that God has ever called. You either part of his chosen people or you are not part of his chosen people. You are grafted into the tree. You are, If you are in Christ, you are Abraham's offspring and heirs to the promise. So what does he say? He says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. That's you and me, my friends. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. Doesn't say that I'll abolish the law. Doesn't say that I'll nail the law to the cross. Doesn't say that I'll send my son to erase the laws and change the laws. Doesn't say any of that, does it? doesn't say that I'm going to replace the Israelites with the Gentile church. It doesn't say that. It says, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That's the new covenant. That's what the new covenant is. And I want you to just know this and understand this. Don't let anybody bulldog you over what the new covenant uh, is and is not, my friends. The New Covenant is all about God's laws being in our hearts. Okay, For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who claim him. Now, where did we see this before? Didn't we just read this in Galatians? We just read this. What does he say? There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all. And that's Galatians 3.27. I had that bookmark E. You have that under E6. Let's just go take that look. Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is not even a male and a female. For you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs, according to promise. Okay? So that's where he's getting this from. And he says it again in the book of Galatians. Okay. So we can know that. We can understand that. We just need to tie these things in and tie these things together so that we can understand what Paul is saying here. He's not preaching against the laws of God anywhere here. He's welding the Israelite people and the Gentiles together. That's his mission, and that's what he's doing. Okay, so he goes on, and he said, what does he say? Um, let's see here, I'm in uh, chapter 9, I'm in the wrong chapter, let me get through here. We are down here, okay. <laughs> There's no distinction between Jew or Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For anyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, then, will they call on him, how will they call on him? in whom they have not believed. Okay? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear some uh, without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. That's you and, he, it's you and me, my friends. You and I. He says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So we need to know and we need to understand, you know, our Messiah tells us in 517, and a lot of people get this kind of mixed up. In 517, our Messiah says, call no man rabbi, call no man on earth your father, and call no man your instructor. He warns us not to do that because he doesn't want us to be led astray by men, right? But if Yeshua HaMashiach is in us, who are you listening to? If, if Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, is in me, and I'm teaching his word, who are you listening to? You're actually listening to him. But what he is saying is, I'm your instructor. He says, I'm your instructor. I want you to test everything that Pastor Scott Villain is saying. 
I don't want you to just believe it. I want you to test it. I want you to look at his fruit to see whether it be rotten or whether it be true. The Bible says, He who says he knows him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So if I'm not keeping the commandments, then I'm a liar and the truth is not in me. You got me. Okay, that's one positive, simple way of knowing a wolf in sheep's clothing. Is he keeping God's seventh day Sabbath? Is he keeping God's appointments and his feast days and his Passover, the true anniversary of the date that Yeshua HaMashiach died on Passover day? Is he keeping that or is he keeping Good Friday? Okay, we need to know and understand. Look, you can just look at a man and know and understand whether or not he's keeping the things of God. He who says he knows him and does not keep his commandments, not man's commandments, his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. We can know that. Okay. So, uh, so again, here he's telling us, let's go back here and let me find my spot here. So he's talking about, he says, and, and how are they to preach unless they are sent? He says, and how are, how are they to hear without someone preaching? So obviously he wants us to preach. He wants us to go out into the world. He wants us to make a difference. In the book of Ephesians, Paul tells uh, us that, uh, that uh, he has sent pastors and teachers for the uplifting in the, in the, uh, the body of Christ, okay, to come to maturity. That's what, that's what we're here for, okay? But ultimately, he is the instructor. He is the instructor, which means we need to read his word, his word, okay, and test everything any man says, and I don't care who it is, including myself. You must test every man that you listen to. Every man that preaches the word of God to you, you must test them. And you can't test me if you don't know your scriptures. And that's why I like to teach the scriptures, because then we can test those who are preaching to us. If we don't know what the scripture says, then how can you test anybody? How can you know whether their fruit is good or rotten? And you don't know what the scripture is. You can't. It's impossible. That's why we need to study to show ourselves approved as we are commanded. Okay, so uh, again, he says, and how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For their vo voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? For Moses said, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. And Isaiah is so bold to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Again, he's talking here, uh, this is about the Gentile people. He says very clearly, he says, for Moses warned them, he says, I will make you jealous, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation, with a foolish nation, I will make you angry. And Isaiah is so bold to say, he says, I have been found by those who did not seek me, I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a dis, uh, disobedient and contrary people. See what he's doing? He's making them jealous, just like he said. That last line is designed to make them jealous and to make them come back. And that's what we as Gentiles are here for, uh, to make them jealous and to make them come back. Help our brothers and our sisters, our, our Jewish brothers and sisters, and the, and the lost sheep from the northern kingdom of Israel, they are all around us. We don't even know who they are. Uh, it could be the guy standing next to you in the lunch line. Who knows? Uh, who is one of the lost sheep of Israel or a descendant of uh, the lost sheep of Israel? We don't know. 
So uh, even each one of us may be a descendant. I mean, unless we really uh, take a look, we don't know. And even if we do look, maybe we don't know. Uh, it's been so long ago. So it's very important for us to know and to understand to treat each other with love and kindness, the same love and kindness that we treat Yahweh God with, and the same kindness that we would treat ourselves with. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you is a great way to go. Because we just never really know who it is you're standing in line with. In fact, the Bible tells us that we have even entertained angels unaware. Uh, many people have entertained angels unaware. And uh, that is biblical. It's script, it comes from the scripture. So, um, right now we're going to stop right here. Because I don't want to go any farther. Because as we progress into the 11th chapter, this is all going to be tied together. So if you're feeling a little kind of loose about this whole thing. You're not understanding exactly what Paul was talking about and the, uh, the separation and the joining of the Israelite people with the Gentiles. You will understand it after reading the 11th chapter of Romans. And uh, we're going to get into that uh, next week because I want to dedicate uh, most of our time to that chapter that we have to share next week. Uh, very important. It, it is. I, I would say it is probably one of the most important uh, chapters in the Bible. Surely one of the most important chapters in the book of Romans that you're ever going to read in the book of Romans. So it is, it is that important. In order for a Christian to know how to follow Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, they must first know who he is, where he came from, what his lineage was, and what you're grafted into. And, and if you are not grafted into that olive tree then you are you have been cut off and uh we're going to talk about that so if you choose to read the read through the 11th chapter of romans you can get a little bit ahead of me there on that and before we dive into it next week but i guarantee you if you read the 11th chapter of romans there's going to be no doubt in your mind who you are and what you belong to and who our messiah actually was so with all of that being said let me go back here um I just want to say thank you so very much for spending your time with us uh, here today. It is it is just absolutely Im imperative that we know and understand how important it is to understand the Scripture and to understand that most of the uh, the New Testament was taken from the Torah, the Old Testament. You know, we talk about we you know what did Paul what's Paul been talking about? He's been talking about the book of Hosea and he's been talking about I, Isaiah and Hosea and and the the prophets of, in the Torah. Then he keeps pointing back to the people of Israel and why did they why did they blow it? Why did they fall so hard? Because they were following after the law not by faith, but as if it was of works. If they had put the laws of God in their hearts and followed it because they loved him, they never would have went astray and they never would have went into this whoredom with all of these other gods because they would have loved God. It would have been in their hearts to do these things. But you see, it was a mechanical thing to them, and that's what God was trying to erase. And that's why he sent his son and said, okay, I'm just going to take away the penalty of the law then. The penalty's taken away. Now, it's up to you. Are you going to follow me or are you going to follow him? Which one of us are you going to follow? And he says... I, I would rather, he says, don't be lukewarm. He says, I would rather that you be hot or cold, because if you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. There is no gray area with Yahweh God the Father. And even today, my friends, you are seeing the gray area disappear. There are not many people straddling the fence. They either are far to the right following God, or they are far to the left. They are so far to the left following this world that you could never imagine that they would ever be able to find their way back to the things of God. And uh, we are seeing that happen right now. And as it gets darker and darker and these clouds come over us, and they are coming, and they are piling on, and it is getting darker, the light will become brighter and brighter and brighter. That's you and me, my friends. We were born for such a time as this. We are living in the end times, and it is important for us to know and to understand these things. You know, the book of Deuteronomy tells us to love the Lord our God and to teach these things diligently to our children and to talk about these things when we lie down and when we awake and when we walk by the way. He says to write them on our hands and, and, and as frontlets between our eyes and to, on our doorposts and on our fences. These are the things that we should be doing. But we can look around the world today and we can know and understand this is not what the world's doing. It's not what they're doing at all. How many people are here at this Bible study? 
How many people will even bother taking the time to sit down and contemplate what we are trying to share with them here today? We ask you to please, please share this Bible study everywhere that you can and download it and keep it for yourself. It is free. Everything we do at HolyImpactMinistries.com is absolutely free. It's free, uh, freely given and it is meant to be freely given. We just simply ask that you please do not sell uh, the videos uh, on a DVD or anything like that. Please give them away for free. Download them, tear them apart, use them to create your own Bible studies. It does no good to take these Bible studies if you are not learning them to the point to where you can reteach them. We want you to go back out and reteach these things and teach the correct word and the proper meaning and the proper context of what Paul was trying to say. Teach them in your own words. Teach them in your own way. But teach them. Teach them to someone. It doesn't do any good to just learn it and then just keep it inside you and not share it. We are to be a light on a hill. We are to share this information with the nations. That's what we are commissioned to do. We are a nation of holy priests, a people that have been chosen out of the darkness to proclaim His excellences. That's who we are. And uh, so I challenge you to please know these, these scriptures and know this book of Romans so well that you can then go on and teach it yourself. And we ask you that you would take all of these things into your prayer closet and pray about them to know that whether or not we are tell what we are telling you is the truth or not. It is important that we ask him for that discernment because it only comes from him. He is the only one that can answer you and tell you whether or not I'm telling you the truth or not. So please, my friends, do this, take this to prayer, know and understand that it is indeed the truth, and then share it with as many people as you can. My hope and my prayer is that the grace and the peace of God would be with you and your family until we meet again, and the protective hand of God would be upon you. We will see you on the next Seventh-day Sabbath, coming up live this next Friday night at 9 o'clock. If we don't see you there, we'll see you at the next Wednesday night Bible study to study the 11th chapter of the book of Romans. God bless you. Thank you for joining us, and shalom. If you were blessed by this teaching, please consider helping us reach the nations by making a donation today. Thank you, and shalom.